Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum on Monday, May 4th. Uh, I read some silly joke today, something about May 4th be with you, you know? Like, yeah, May the next. Okay, so it was silly when I read it. It sounded sillier when I said it, so I'll apologize for that. Folks, today we have an interesting program. We have invited all the candidates for the two positions for school board in Forest Grove. And unfortunately, that's what we do. We invite people, and sometimes people just can't make it. We have one candidate for one of the positions, and we'll be hearing from him shortly. We also have two candidates for the Sherwood City Council. They are both here, and we'll be getting to that in just one moment. Folks, my name is Rob Solomon, and I have the honor of being the chair and president of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. And I thought I'd take just a couple of minutes today, as we have some time. I'd like to go around the room and have some folks say just their name, why they're here today. And as we're making some different moves with the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, you'll see that in our fall season when we start up. If you have any suggestions for something you'd like to see up here, when we have elections, folks, we have candidates usually coming up the woodwork, so to speak. Candidates are very happy to come here, and we're very, very happy to welcome and provide, all right, forgive me, but a forum for discussion and ideas. So today, if we could just get a little sense, if anybody has a great suggestion for some of the things that you think we should be doing, great. But otherwise, if you would just say your name and what brought you here today. And I'd like to start off with this gentleman to my immediate left who's talking right now because he just told me a rumor that there's a rumor going around, believe it or not, that Eric Squires, our executive director, is conservative. Gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Eric Squires. Hi, the rumors are true. <laughs> and, next, and next to Eric, who do we have? Yeah, Phil Nelson, the secretary. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Spencer Ehrman, I live in South Beaverton. John Blackman, Forest Grove, and I'm just here to find out what's going on in the community. Cool. Uh, Don Pennant, candidate for School District 15. Welcome, Don. John Williams, a uh, board member, and um, last year with the forum, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, my term's going to expire, so uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to see some specific opportunities uh, coming in this room. Cool. Thank you, John. And that, I didn't plan this, but as an opportunity, John's work is legendary with the forum. We'll be missing him when his term is up. Thank you, John. Ma'am? Lana Painter, and I'm um, with Sherwood Chamber of Commerce. Ah, welcome. Thank you. I'm Selma Broadhurst from Sherwood. I'm here to support her. Welcome. Heather Jackson. I'm actually from Tiger Cut Tiger, but also Sherwood. Um, <laughs> yes. And I'm here to support her. Welcome, Heather. I'm Renee Browse, and I'm running for Sherwood City Council. Hello, Renee. Thank you. I'm Randy Browse, and I'm here to support Renee Browse. Thank you. I'm Martin Lane, and I'm here to support Renee. All right. A lot of supporters in the room. Cool. Sir? I'm Jim Hayes. I'm here with my friends Renee Browse and her family, also Yvonne Flom and her family, but I'm here to support Renee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, a, it's an interesting community. <laughs> Sir. I'm Anthony Mills. I'm the treasurer of the Public Affairs Forum, and if you'd like to become a member, we have membership forms over there, and we also have a matching donation program where an anonymous benefactor is matching donations up to $3,500. So we still have a ways to go at that point. Any amount that you want to donate will be matched up to $3,500. Um, so if you have any donations or memberships, see the <coughs> at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. We didn't even ask him to do that. See how good he is? You. Sir, you are? I'm Rod Janelle. I've, in my, my career, I, I spent a lot of time on state and uh, federal government. Uh, I just like to see what's going on. Okay. Thank you. I'm Sally Bunnell. I've been coming for a long time to learn about all of the organizations and, and the people running for office in Washington County. Thank you, sir. I'm Al Falcone from Aloha. And the reasons why I'm here is because I like to hear what the political people have to say and also our other speakers, what they have to say so we get a better feel of a knowledge of what is going on in the area. Thank you, Al. Hi, I'm Emily Nutt. I live in Hillsborough, but I keep track of everybody running for office. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emily. I'm Thomas Gephardt from Sherwood, also Yvonne uh, Gephardt's uh, cousin. Hey. 
I'm Ron Gephardt, and what brings me here is a gracious invitation to speak about why I'm running for City Council. And we will look forward to it. Thank you for being here. Ma'am? Thank you. Yeah. Sir? Hello, Jim. I'm Bill Kroger. I'm a Beaverton novelist. I've been a member of the board for about 11 years, and I'm here today because that's what members do. They go to meetings. <laughs> well authored, sir. I'm Chris Leslie. I live in Rock Creek, and I like to stimulate free speech and difficult questions for the people if Jim doesn't. <laughs> Speakers beware. There may be some difficult questions generated from this group. Sir? Uh, Neil Shannon, citizen of Sherwood. Hello, Neil. Harry Boudin, I, I come because I learn something new every time. Cool, Harry. Thank you. We need to put that on a poster. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the process, each candidate will have five minutes to do their presentation. And then, <clears throat> pardon me, I think what we'll do with the our presentations today, considering there's only one uh, representative from Forest Grove, I think what we'll do is we'll have the first candidate, who will be re um, Yvonne, come up uh, for Sherwood City Council, give her five minutes, Renee five minutes, and then we'll come up here, for, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions if the two candidates will come up here after their presentations. There will be timed uh, presentations here. Spencer, who is about to chew, will get Spencer. He is our timekeeper, and he will let you know when you have one minute, when you have 30 seconds, and when the hook is coming from behind the stage. Um, and that's sort of true. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, without any further time uh, that I shall take, let me have the pleasure of introducing Yvonne Gephardt. Yvonne, please come on up. Good afternoon. <laughs> I want to thank the forum for inviting us to come and speak about how we're running for Sherwood City Council. Um, I'm Yvonne Gebhardt, and I'm running for a vacant seat in the Sherwood City Council. I was born in Mexico City and immigrated to the United States when I was two years old with my mother and my brother. Then in 2001, I actually uh, became a naturalized American citizen. And while I was doing that, I, was, I had a room full of 200 other people that were actually taking the oath of citizenship as well. And they elected me to be the leader of the Pledge of Allegiance, and I was so excited about that. And at that time, um, it was a beautiful courtroom at the Mark Hatfield Federal Building, downtown Portland. And I was inspired and called to run for public office at that time. And it was a federal office, so I went to the U.S. Constitution to see what the re requirements were for that particular office, and I found out that I needed to be a citizen for nine years. So since that time, I've been preparing and taking steps toward that goal, and this running for city council is one of those steps because I ran a um, testing the waters campaign and found out that voters would like someone with a little bit of experience in government. Although um, I think that our government could probably use somebody who's not so well versed in how the bureaucracy is going and come in with some really good ideas on that. But getting back to Sherwood, <laughs> which is also kind of a little microcosm of the national level, we, it really all begins at the local level. And so I have uh, several things that are very important to me. Uh, public service, I'm sorry, public safety, uh, economic development, citizen engagement, and protecting our quality of life. Public safety, is the first priority, I think, of any government or municipality. We need to support our families by making sure that all is done within the law, within the second, uh, fourth, and fifth amendments in the protection of people and property. 
I think that's paramount. That's the most important thing for government to do. Um, we need to have uh, police and law enforcement that come uh, in a timely manner when they're needed. So secondly is economic development and supporting families by maintaining a business-friendly environment. We don't want to regulate our businesses so much that nobody can make a profit. And we, don't, we also don't want to decide um, who can be in business and who can't be in business. I think that should be done by the free market uh, system. Thirdly is uh, protecting our quality of life, our parks and recreations. In Sherwood, it's a beautiful place to live. I've lived there for 20 years. I would recommend anyone to come and visit, and our parks are wonderful. We have a new performing arts center that is absolutely wonderful, and you would just enjoy it. But uh, that is something that's important to our, our citizens, and we vote in a lot of things you know, through the budget. The budget is also very important. <laughs> When, and lastly is citizen engagement. And this is something that's really true, very dear to my heart. Because without citizen engagement, our government is going to go crazy as it has. And I appreciate groups like this, uh, groups like Toastmasters International. Um, I've been involved in many different boards and commissions, and I uh, really appreciate uh, citizen involvement, and I'd like to see our council members canvass the neighborhoods and talk to people about issues that are going through the city council that matter and that affect their lives. Please go to my website, www.yvonnegebhardt.info, and you'll learn more about Sherwood and about me. Thank you. And if Renee would join us, please. Renee Bruce. All right. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation. I surely appreciate it. As stated, my name is Renee Browse, and I am running for Sherwood City Council. Sherwood has a history of visioning and planning, which has ultimately made us what we are today, a community that is well sought after and a very livable community. My family and I, my husband Rob of 24 years, and my two children, Brittany and Brandon, who are now young adults, moved to Sherwood eight and a half years ago. I have been serving through the YMCA for 18 years, and we had the opportunity to come to Sherwood and serve in a new capacity and a new branch. It is run by the YMCA, but is actually a very unique partnership with the city of Sherwood. It is also a model throughout the country. So it's a very interesting relationship that is a part of that whole idea of vision and planning. Prior to serving in the YMCA, I was actually in the restaurant industry where I served as manager of various restaurants and also a resident trainer. I have a BA in political science in Spanish with a focus in international studies. Career has been a, my career and my life has been focused on service. And this can be exemplified in a number of areas through serving in the city of Sherwood. As a Rotarian, I've served as the treasurer, the president of the club, the service chair. I'm currently the international chair. And one of the pieces that's very fun for me is our annual campaign where we raise funds that actually go back into the community. And a grant was written by, my, by myself that actually funded the Murdoch Park to $52,000. So it saved the city $52,000 through the Rotary Club of Sherwood. I've also served the business community, serving alongside Lana uh, as the president of the Sherwood Chamber and also as a chamber ambassador. Being involved in the community in different sectors is extremely important to me. Uh, the high school in Sherwood is a place that I've served as the, the speech and debate coach. I've also served in the career center. I've taught JA to local elementary school students and I teach self-defense at a local charter school for the middle school students. I would 
Explaining to be a born volunteer is something that I truly believe in and truly love to do. And for me, this next step is in city council. I also believe I have the proven leadership qualities that have been afforded me through the YMCA uh, throughout the last 18 years. Skills such as problem solving and critical thinking, leading groups and team, coaching others, communication skills and facilitation skills, and I'm recognized as a national trainer in those qualities. Service and work is what I do, and through those points of contact in our community at various levels, I've heard our citizens speak and, and have asked them questions and listened to them. And what I hear from them are a variety of different issues, one of which is being highly taxed. The residents claim that they spend a lot of money in taxes, which is true. <laughs> We do, we're a highly taxed community. So keeping the, liv the livability in our, in our community, but also being able to sustain it and take some of the tax burden off, our, off of our residents. We can do that by de business development. So that's another area. And when you talk about de business development, then you hear about small business, medium business, industrial. So it becomes a large topic of conversation. We also hear a lot about transportation, whether that is the connectivity to the I-5 corridor, the Tualatin Sherwood Road traffic, traffic on 99. Those are some key points of, of conversation, but I hear almost daily the connectivity by TriMet extended into the city of Sherwood. Public safety, Yvonne already spoke about that. Public safety is one of the number one priorities that I hear as well from our citizen. And that could be uh, the drug prevention, it could be the safety of our streets, keeping the police department in Sherwood. There's multiple topics there. So good planning and visioning has gotten Sherwood where it is today, a highly desirable, pl desirable place to live, work, and play with high achieving schools, network of parks and recreation, a research rich library, nationally accredited police department, and award winning government staff. Sherwood is a great place to be. What I want to leave you with today is positive leadership, positive momentum will equal a positive Sherwood. Thank you so much. Hope we have Renee and Yvonne up here, and it's time for questions. Remember, we have a reputation. The questions are penetrating, difficult. No, and they're not shaking yet. So, okay. <laughs> we, the questioners will stand right up here, and please identify who you're asking. If you're asking both candidates or just one. Okay. Renee? Thanks. You need to be a member. Oh, I'm not reminded of the rules. I apologize for some that aren't here. Only paid up members of the forum are allowed to ask questions. So those of you with burning questions who aren't paid up, once again, our treasurer is right over there. <laughs> Spencer, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Spencer Ehrman. I'm a member of the forum. My question is, has to do with the role that suburban communities play in the greater metropolitan area. Um, there have been uh, uh, concerns um, within uh, the transportation community that outlying, outlying communities such as Sherwood, Tigard, and Tualatin um, are unimpressed with uh, mass transit and um, the goals of <clears throat> um, trying to uh, encourage people to get out of cars and get into buses and, 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 and other uh, ways of, of reducing traffic, and I'm curious if, uh, if you, both of you, if you feel that that's an important uh, piece to be considered. Thank you very much, Spencer. Transportation, yes, I think that's super important, and you're right. There's a big push for to get people out of their cars and into car, uh, buses, carpooling, that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> I don't have a problem with transportation uh, solutions as long as they're not like in the bazillions of dollars to do it. I think there's a way that we can all get together and figure out how to make it affordable but also keep our roads um, safe and, and not clogged up. Very good question. I too believe in public transportation and the statistics are showing that the next generation of young people are actually going to be more inclined for public in transportation versus their own vehicles because they're more conscious of our environment. From conversations that I've had with TriMet and with our public taking place in some of the forums, it is getting more traction. I've even spoken with some of the HOAs in Sherwood and they, there's some traction there as well. 
So what I'm hearing from them that there's still a little fear and pushback about having the larger buses, but having some of the smaller buses in the streets of Sherwood is, is definitely something that they're interested in. Harry Modine, forum member. <clears throat> Last week, the Oregon Supreme Court issued a decision which basically handed you guys the keys to the Titanic, uh -huh. along with every school board in the state and every local government. And that is, to bring a PERS bill is coming due starting January of 17, for the fiscal year of 17. That's 870 million statewide. So what, how is Sherwood going to deal with this? How should the council do it? Is it going to have to, what services would you cut? Or would you go to the voters and say, we need an extra levy to keep, keep what we have? So I think that's a conversation that we need to have with our school board more in detail. Uh, and I'm not really privy with all the information that, it, that is out there on that. My recollection from what I've determined in the past, looking through the, risk, the history and the facts of what Sherwood has done in the past, they are very amenable to making sure that our kids are well educated uh, and do everything they can to make sure that they're set, set in that realm. Uh, the school district has their budget set already and there is, there are some funds there. So I would want to have more conversation with the school board in the direction that they're, that they're going to be able to have a better answer for you at this particular point in time. I agree. As the chair of the Sherwood Budget Committee for several years, at the end there we actually talked about PERS and what, how that was going to affect us because um, that's a big bill to cover. And uh, the budget committee is going to be, they already had one meeting, but they're going to be meeting again, and I plan to attend that meeting and find out what, what's in the, what's, uh, in the budget for that very purpose. It's, and you're right, it's a big one. Hey, thank you very much. Jeff Williams, board member, and thank you both. Uh, I think that they, they have two positions open because you both sound very qualified to me. And I uh, wish you both a bit, uh, lots of good fortune in, this, in your campaigns. Um, my question also, a little bit of uh, what Harriet was talking about. Um, the, the money that comes to schools actually comes from the state. And I'm sure the purpose is really affected there. Well, um, the legislative people are the ones who decide how much money goes to who. And right now there's three pots that the money goes into. And so who's going to give up what money to give more to education or, or how is it going to come to the school? And I realize that's an education experience. But then you also you have a big budget that you're dealing with. You, somebody talked about the high property taxes. And uh, so uh, money is a big deal. So uh, you've got my experiences with that as well. Did I say that question? Like you to hear it or? I'm not 100% sure what you're asking. Okay, I'm, well, I'm asking about um, how do you deal with the money? <laughs> how do you deal with the money as far as the budget process? Sure. Uh, you both have spoken that, that there's competing dollars. And what I would rely on is the experience of our city government, the, the staff who work with those budgets on a day-to-day -day basis and their expertise but I also like to hear what the community members have to say and their concerns that have been addressed are the high taxes so business development um, we also hear about transportation the school the schools and how they're performing but as far as how you divide those pots of money out I would want to see the recommendations coming from our city staff read over the material, look at it, and then see if it jives with what I'm hearing from the public, and then if it makes sense, and then go from there. So for me, it's a communication and a lot of conversation. Thank you. Yes, the legislature has a lot of influence on how the municipalities spend their money and what we do. A lot of our revenue is shared revenue, and so um, <coughs> I think that the key is to have the city council and groups from the community actually go to Salem and start talking to people and our legislators and the committees that are these bills are going through and explain you know what the voters want what our um, community wants and so 
Um, more recently, we have the uh, recreational marijuana bill that passed that was not completely passed by the voters of Sherwood. So that is also a revenue source that the state is looking at for, for schools, I believe. All right, thank you. Chris Leslie, former member. This question is more with study halls. What system of study halls do you believe in, or do you have any study halls for children from uh, kindergarten up to improve their scholastic abilities? For both of them. These guys are running for city council, Chris? Yeah, school. I will, I'll get there. You might want to save that question for our next speaker. Yeah. Okay. I, no. I told Sorry. them I told you guys difficult questions. I mean, with all due respect, if you want to try it, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. You want? Sure. Why not? I have an opinion about study. <laughs> Although I'm not running for a school board, I, I think that our kids really need to have a solid, solid education in math in reading and writing and there are so many things that we've dumbed down uh, applications to things just because people can't read big words like um, appointment or I don't know something like that but I, I think that the common core has is really something that we're kind of threw us off the bandwagon and we're trying to figure out how to do math now again and I don't know I use Khan Academy online and it works really well so there's a lot of challenges to our school system that are happening because of what's going on online yeah, I'll take a stab at it too the study hall question did throw me off uh, with with the changes in education the common core as a parent I cannot tell you how glad I am my kids are now out of school because it's difficult I mean how do you help your students when it's changing so frequently uh, I'm a big believer in education as well and having the tools in place to help the students succeed and that is why the Career Center at the, at the Sherwood High School is so important because it helps walk the kids through what they need to graduate, what their next steps are in planning. So figuring that out, it might come in the form of after school programs, doing more study hall type after school homework assistance and working with our community, community partners like Mathnasium. Thank you. I realize it wasn't appropriate, but it's a great way to show your qualifications. Hi, Anthony Mills. Um, welcome. The topic of water is one that's important for a lot of communities and sourcing. I don't know where Sherwood gets their water, so I don't have any agenda in asking this question, but it's in the news for other communities right now. So for those of us who don't live in Sherwood, could you explain where the water comes from? What are some of the uh, controversial topics that may be? And does the city council, are they also the water board or is there a separate water board? Or Could you explain that? <laughs> yes, um, again, uh, being on the budget committee, we talked a lot about water and water fees, and our water actually comes from uh, the Willamette River. To be there one. The Willamette River, and we are also partnering with Wilsonville. We're putting in this huge pipeline that brings in many thousands and millions of gallons of water. And Sherwood is actually in a very good position with water, whereas um, other communities are having to raise their rates by huge amounts, like 20, 30 percent. We are uh, going to raise our rates also, but. Uh, at least that's going to be a proposal at the budget that I've learned of. So, and no, there's no water board that I know of. I think it's all within the city. And it used to be Tualatin Valley um, water, water District, yes. And so we brought it into Sherwood. It's out of the car. So the topics that I hear around the water, the water question actually just came up at a most recent hearing at the city council. And there is a proposed increase, I think, I want to say it's 3%, I could be off on that. So that will be coming before council here soon. The purpose behind that is for sustainability for the future. So we're set really well in the city of Sherwood at this particular point in time. But as Sherwood West comes on board and, and if Brookman is annexed in, 
we need to continue to set our community up for success. So what they're proposing now is an increment in our bill to sustain for sustainability in the future. That there's a rub there because our bills are higher in the highest in the region. Part of that is because we also have clean water services in there. So if we really analyze the bill, we'll see that part of that is clean water services. And if we go back in history and see why we did what we did in the city of Sherwood, we will in my opinion, come to the conclusion that we are setting ourselves up for the success in the future generations. Yvonne, Renee, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Appreciate your hands and those difficult questions, too. I know, there can only be one winner. Um, and as a matter of fact, we have one out of five candidates here coming up with uh, Forest Grove, uh, excuse me, Forest Grove School District. For positions number, position number four, the two candidates are Ben Ehrenholt and Kate Granduski. We did invite both of them, and we did hear from Kate. She was unable to be here, and we did not hear back from Ben to the best of my knowledge. We're sorry that they can't be here, but as far as we know, they're still on the ballot. Um, for position number five, Fred Marble and David Rose did not respond to our invitations, as I understand it, but Don Henning is here, and in just one moment I will introduce him. When I ask Don to come up front, I'm going to give him the five minutes, he'll be timed, and then we'll just open it directly to questions. And I'm only going to ask Don to speak on behalf of his candidacy. There's four other people here, but I think we'll just invite Don to talk about Don. Don, would you join us up here, please? Don Henning. For position five. Thank you. Before you start my clock, Spencer, I want to try and address the previous questions while they're fresh. In regard to PERS reform, the answers to PERS reform are going to come out of Salem. <clears throat> I would suggest a needs test, much like I would su suggest needs tests for Social Security problems. Mike Bellotti doesn't need to make a quarter million bucks a year on PERS, but the teachers and the aides do need their pension benefits. So as far as PERS goes, I believe the solution is going to come out of Salem. Um, I'd like to also point out that the, the, the PERS reform uh, cancellation by the court is a year out. We can address that with the next budget cycle. So we have a year to work on it. But I'd also point out that the same legislative session, this year's legislative session, which delivered this year's budget, has also required full-time kindergarten, and that is a big impact on the schools. Uh, it looks like Forest Grove District could lose you know, more than a dozen normal teaching positions to create the budget space for the additional kindergarten teachers required for full-time kindergarten. We now have like 18 half-time kindergarten classes, which means you have to pick up 18 new teachers to cover that. Some of them can expand full-time, but it's a real issue and it's coming at us this budget cycle. About the study hall question, I would suggest that digital uh, interconnectivity and digital tools be available to kids in student halls. All right, start the clock. Um, I'm an at-large candidate and I'm going to try and point out I, I think is a critical issue in school district 15 that I think prevails in other districts. I was hoping for a larger Proud here to get a little survey of, of other um, school board members, active and inactive, and other candidates, but I'll point out my point in a minute. But I, the first thing I want to offer is uh, School District 15 is formerly known as the Forest Grove School District, but as a candidate, I use the phrase Cornelius Forest Grove School District, and I'll use that phrase um, as a board member as well, because as you move eastward through the district, in the Cornelius, the population becomes increasingly, increasingly Latino. And from my, my experience in talking to the two communities, there is a big difference between them in terms of how they see, see their school system. And surprisingly, to the Forest Grove individuals, I perceive that the more Latino the community, the more Latino the neighborhood, the more they appreciate their school system and the more they appreciate the performance of their teachers. That's also associated with the fact that Cornelius has a, an elementary school support environment and all the high school kids are in Forest Grove. Now, I wear my uh, 
uh, the Kate Kierndusky uh, campaign button, because Kate is my wife. There's some community concerns about a husband-wife team on a five-member board. And my comment is, our school board has been far too deferential to the superintendent for far too long, and I'll tell you why. Same issue, I think, is occurring down in uh, Portland Public School District, which creates that comment. Far too def the boards are far too deferential. When I did some background work, did my due diligence and what a board member's responsibilities are, the roles, the rights, and the responsibilities of a board member to the citizens of the district, it's number one to preserve and protect the resources of the district. And the number one resource is the money. And there's an attorney mentioned uh, introduced here. If I'm wrong on this, please correct me. But I was amazed when I talked to the auditor that there is no line item audit chase or audit performance on our annual school budget reports. We have a full audit process, but it does not look at where the money actually goes. When we start our budget process, they break it up to the general fund format, which is impossible to read. It's a 103-page document. It breaks all kind of money groupings out. I think there should be a simple, readable budget and budget audit format. It's almost there in the document that the school district prepares and provides into the audit report. But the, the issue I see, I want to know principals, clerics, the people who are in the, in, in the, the contact role with the students, the, the student interface, the classroom interface people, the teachers, the aides, the principals, the front line people. I want to know how many, what the headcount is and what the budget is for those student contact individuals. Then we'll break out the food service, we'll break out the transportation as outside contracts. I want to know what the cost per headcount is for senior administration, that's directors and above in each school district, so we know what the true cost of administration is. The way the budget is presented now, it is just unreadable to the average person. So the main issue I have, thank you, the main issue I have with the board is appointed members, members of the board who were originally appointed, this group probably particularly understands the power of incumbency. As I can determine from you know, my personal survey of board members, for the last 20 years, a majority of the Forest Grove board was originally appointed to the board, not elected at large. My wife was elected at large against an incumbent. I am elected, I hope to be elected at large at an incumbent. But what happens is the superintendent in the school district is able to introduce candidates, seek out candidates, because the public in general just doesn't Adequate candidates don't stand up to be on the school, school board. Then the appointees are kind of groomed. The appointees come in with a six months or a year. People are resigning so the school board, uh, the, so the superintendent can, can create candidates. The, then the remaining majority board typically approves the candidates that the superintendent has proposed and it perpetuates the problem of a board that is non-responsive to the community and overly responsive to the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And answering questions first. Maybe you've taken the questions away from our crowd. I don't know. But folks, it's time for questions. If you have any, please step up to the mic. And I think we've got some coming. So, Don, please. Thank you. Questions? Again, you know, on the you mentioned kindergartens as well as PERS, but if it's a combination of such, if Salem does not magically produce a lot of money, uh, what, what will you do if you're forced into a slash and burn mode on school district? Number two is, would you consider asking the voters of Forest Grove to up their property tax on their home another hundred bucks or more to maintain the programs that otherwise would be cut? And I'll just add one thing, one personal note. I sure hope that Viking House has not become a casualty of this process. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying Viking House is a great program, and I like the way it works. The loss of the other trades programs and vocational programs is a big problem for me. I can't give you an answer on what I'd ask the community to do in the event. 
of continued uh, cutbacks in the, the money coming to us. Um, I, I can't answer that question. Um, I, I did have one dramatic idea that was not well received uh, by the senior administration. That would be what I call um, superintendents sharing adjacent districts. That's one big item right there. Superintendents sharing adjacent districts. Their roles are highly involved with, with delegation of their, of their director level staff. And they, uh, the superintendents tend to spend a lot of time outside of the district. They're in Salem. I think it's at least, we, we can at least look at the idea of any budget cuts that have to be made, it shouldn't all fall on the classified teachers and the unclassified aides. Uh, budget cuts should fall throughout the, the cost structure of the budget, including senior administration. Thanks for the question. You know what? You sat down there and thought you were kidding. <laughs> John Blackman, I'm just a forum member. Uh, I heard recently that uh, two things seem to be very important. I'd like your reaction to it. Uh, the first thing is, is a child ready for kindergarten? And the second thing is, on the third grade tests of mathematics and reading, does a child meet the specifications for that? Thank you. Well, pre-K is real important. Everyone gets a tiny amount of the, a tiny amount of the funds out there. Um, I can tell you that all education funds from the general fund, this is from the superintendent's um, budget talking points, uh, 11, 12 years ago, education pre-K, K to 12, and post, post high school was 61% of the general fund budget. In the last 10 years, that's gone down to around 51%. So there's been almost a 20% cut in, the, in our kids' uh, education budgets. The great majority of that total amount goes to K through 12. In, uh, in, in Washington County, the, the pre-K program is, is just an excellent program for what I under, understand what I've seen of it. I missed a part of your question. Okay. Did I miss a part? No, I just, uh, what your reaction is to the, what I read was that, is the child ready for kindergarten? Oh, and it, does the child meet the standard for third grade? I, I'm sorry, I don't know the report you referred to, but I, I will run sideways on that question. Your opinion on it, anyway. I don't have an opinion, because I, I don't, don't have a clue what you're referring to, sir, about third grade. But I can tell you that I think Pearson, Pearson Foundation, Pearson Education Foundation, is an English company and it is now a multi-billion dollar part of the Common Core testing system. And if you want to be surprised, go to pearson.com slash test samples and you will not believe what is being shown as their webpage literature for sample reading comprehension texts. Uh, I, was, I was outraged by what I saw presented and what is going to be universally presented. Uh, to our, our kids as part of the Pearson testing program. I have a lot of trouble with Pearson. And it's big, big money. Pearson's making a half billion dollars a year in Texas right now. And they have lawsuits coming out the ears. Another question, please. Yes, uh, John McWilliams again. Uh, the federal um, government, well, uh, education system really is uh, introducing uh, Common Core. And I think there are some federal dollars attached to that. Um, so, uh, where is Forest Grove in this? Because I understand that some school districts are opting out. Is federal money in order doing that? When I look at some of the text materials that our kids are going to be compelled to deal with, when I look at the format of the texting, the format of the tests, I, I'm, I, I'm very upset about it. On the other hand, you can't walk away from the No Child Left Behind cost mandates associated with Common Core testing. I'm a candidate, I'll look into it uh, very seriously. As a board member, I, I'm conflicted. I, I see a lot of reasons to step away from Common Core. When I talked about the line item accountability, 
I've asked several times, my wife as a board member for over four years has asked several times, nobody will provide the information on what the real costs are for common core testing and these barrages of tests. Fifth graders this year will take 11 standardized tests in one year. Some of these tests are seven and a half hours long administered over a two day period and each test day requires a half a day prep time minimum. I added it up. Those fifth graders are going to lose over 20% of their syllabus instruction time taking these tests. In addition to the true cost of time lost is the dollar amount. Nobody can tell me what the state is paying to Pearson. It doesn't show up in the budgets. I, I know that uh, the year uh, my wife Kate was elected to the school board, our school district bought what was called Pearson's curriculum in a box. I don't know what a curriculum in the box is, but we bought that program for a tune of 700,000 bucks. At the same time, we were closing libraries, dumping libraries, and dumping teachers, and the program didn't work for, didn't work well. So the real cost in time, the real cost in dollars, and why can't we know these costs? Yes, sir. Chris Leslie, four member. Uh, 1956, I believe, um, they added uh, under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. And I objected to that then, and I still do now, because this nation is one nation, indivisible for all. And there has to be no God in the Pledge. How do you stand on that? I leave it out when I say the Pledge, I leave it out. I, if I, I have a chance to put it, take a vote on it, God goes out of the Pledge. Right. Thank you. Please. Don, uh, thanks for being here. My name is Eric Squires, forum member. Uh, your service to the community, just even staying up as a candidate is really appreciated. I'd like to ask you about something I learned about in the Beaverton School District. They have a line item in their budget for something called a TOSA, or TOSA, Teacher on Special Assignment. The concern that was shared with me is that some teachers were parked as TOSAs, so they were basically not in the classroom. I'm curious if you've looked at the budget of the Forest Grove School District and are aware of any teachers that are out on special assignment and are not in the classrooms. And if so, if that would be something that you would take uh, upon yourself to get those teachers back into the classroom or, or back um, uh, providing direct student care. If I could find them in the budget, I'd have more to say about it, but okay. I cannot find that kind of item in the budget. When I go to ask my business manager where it is, I can't get to her. The rules are set up to work against board members. The Oregon School Board Association issues these, these documents that come out to all the 200 school districts, and the current one really points to my issue. The School Board Association creates a, a, a document that makes an effort to raise the amount of money that the superintendent can spend on any given entity without the board's approval. It used to be $10,000, it went to $50,000, I don't know how many years ago, but right now, District 15 is contemplating, the leadership of the board, which is really two people, is contemplating the structure by which this large amount of additional money without board review will be given to the superintendent. I'm opposed to that kind of thing. If the, if the superintendent has a budget item over $50,000, we are there, we can be called, we can get in. The board should know about every cost item like that. And the 150K new unreviewed signature authority, there is no limit to how many $150,000 checks our superintendent can write in a month. She could write a dozen of them without the board approving it. That's crazy. And this happens because there's only two members on the board, my wife and a fellow named Lonnie Winkler, who were elected at large. The other five members, whether or not they're incumbent for a term or two terms, they're appointed when somebody resigns from the board. The superintendent, and they have, they have the resources. They can go into the community. They can re recruit individuals who they would like to see on the board. And then the board, the remaining board majority for over well, way more than 10 years, probably close to 20 years, has appointed, has approved the appointment of these vacancy fillers 
and then they gain long terms via the power of incumbency. It's a big, big issue, and I think it happens all over. The when I did my due diligence and and uh, looked at the roles, rules, and responsibility of a board member in a nonprofit or a government agency. It's number one to protect the resources available to the citizens of the district. The number one resource is the money. And without line item auditing, without a readable budget, the public doesn't know where their money's going from. And the, the business, just for this group's information, um, of our 30 million bucks for a one year budget, a little over two thirds comes from the state's divvying up of, of your state income tax. The rest of it comes from your local tax measures, where you pay your local, where you, where you pay your local annual tax property bill. That's John, less than a third. John, thank you. It sounds like that uh, we've touched upon a really sore point, and that you need better level of granularity for accessing the budget. So, thank you. Thank you. That's my big point. So, I have one more quick question, uh, John McWilliams, and that's uh, Forest Grove is very fortunate to have a university in the town, only one of Washington County, as a matter of fact. Uh, do, the, do the school district work with the university to um, bring support into the classrooms, or how do they work with that? Not, not enough. My campaign slogan is students, communities, and schools. The community element includes the police force, the businesses, and in our district, particularly the university, I would like to see a lot of opportunity for high school kids to just spend some time, starting when they're young, spend some time to get out on the campus, see what a campus looks like and feels like, go through, go, go and look into a lecture hall. If you want a good idea of what I think high schools should be doing for college prep and to relate to colleges, look at the Hillsborough School District webpage. They have a great program. Uh, starting in the seventh grade, telling kids how they have to prepare for any post high school education experience while they're in high school how to study, how to use your free time in the, in, the, in, the, in the study halls, how to use digital media and the internet. And then, in, in, in the Hillsborough District, kids are required to graduate. They're required to grab, get these, what they call, post-12 uh, training equivalents. I forget the exact language. But you are required to take classes on how to matriculate out of high school in the college and how to prepare to do the things you need to do in high school to have a shot at college. It's a great program. Uh, we don't do it in Fort Scott. One last question. Please. Yeah, John Blackman, forum member again. Outside of tradition, the American summer vacation started because the child was needed on the farm. Since farmers now comprise about maybe two or three percent of the population, why, compared with many other countries, do we still have this long, long summer vacation? Great question. Um, I, I think our physical plant, our, our, the, the, the brick and mortar school buildings, should be more of a community.